people have been trying to get rid of the notch since the notch existed. Since the beginning of the notch. Really? The notch era mm. on smartphones. We got so used to the idea of it. Maybe not a full out notch like the iPhone has been doing, but we got used to the idea of some kind of cutout for a front facing camera. Mm. It got crazy. You remember the Pixel device, Pixel 4? It got crazy for a minute. Mm -hmm. They put the radar in there. It's a giant forehead on that thing. And uh, then it started to shrink a little bit. People were like, at least in the Android space, they determined, okay, we're going to get rid of some of the sensors. And we're just going to make it just a simple front facing camera. Companies like Samsung went in there and they named things Infinity O. With the little dot. I didn't tell them to name it that. They did not conference with myself. They could ask me. You would have picked that name? Yeah, they actually nailed it. Yeah. That I would have said the exact yeah. same. I said, you didn't need my help. You already had Infinity O. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, everybody kind of knows that this is a stopgap. Everybody has a feeling deep in their... Loins? Deep in their loins! Yeah. That this was, it was only a matter of time before some new technology would be able to eliminate this ugly cutout. Hmm. Well, that day is maybe closer than you ha uh, would have imagined. We have had devices with the motors, bringing the camera up and down with the motors. People were a little bit apprehensive about that solution because they were saying, what about the durability? You tell me I'm going to open and close 100,000 times. What if I want to use face unlock? It's popping up and down every time. Yeah. Now it worked. It did work. It was cool. But I also understand the apprehension. You spend a few dollars on a smartphone, you might want the whole thing to be solid state, no moving parts. Mm -hmm. Motors scare people. Mm -hmm. Well, today, Will. Today I'm about to blow your mind. Today? Yeah, today's the day. Okay. This is the world's first phone with a camera under the display, which is the solution everyone's been waiting for, which is a thing that's been shown off by other manufacturers. I believe Xiaomi showed something like this off. I believe Oppo showed something like this off. But it was in the future. It was, we'll get there one day. Look at what we're working on. Isn't it great? But then you sort of saw the sides of the, of the video clips, and you said, I can kind of see where that camera is under the display, even when, you know, when, I'm, when the camera's not being used. Mm -hmm. And so I started to wonder about the state of the technology, because in order to achieve this, the display is going to have to go transparent or close to transparent in the region over top of the camera module when you want to use it. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a teaser from ZTE, who claims they're going to be the very first ones to hit the market with the under-display camera, the future of all smartphones. The ZTE Axon 20 5G will be the world's first smartphone with an under-display camera. Hmm. So you just send the email to ZTE because we're going to check it out. Already did. Already did? I did, yeah. Stop it. Did you actually? Yeah, two days ago. Wow! Can't even come nope. in here think I'm telling you something here. No reply. No reply. Okay. All right. I, I don't know. We're still in talks. Still in talk. Yeah. Well, ZTE, we'll it uh, it's time to respond to Willie Do because we want to check out this under display camera. Now, my expectation is that the under display camera would take some sort of a some sort of a hit on quality. Guess what? I don't really care that much because mm -hmm. I'm not a big selfie guy. Mm -hmm. So if it works in a pinch and if it works for face unlock, that might be all right with me. Now there are some specifications listed, but the images right now are pretty vague. All the images that were shared by ZTE, the renders, uh, they don't they show the screen off. So I'm not sure what good that is. You yeah. see? But it, but it is a teaser, so I'll give them that. I'll let them tease. And they're not going to have to tease for that long because their announcement, their actual event where, where they're going to show this thing off is September 1st. Mm. And I'm looking at my watch right now and I'm saying that's not that far away. Mm. So this uh, this future, the notchless notchless future, yeah, it's not an iPhone. It's a ZTE device, so it's not like it's going to be widely adopted instantaneously, but this is often how these things happen. Hmm. A development comes from a Chinese firm. We got to be honest. Oftentimes, when we saw a motorized camera, 
When we saw the aggressive screen to body ratio, the first place we were seeing these things, what were companies like Oppo? I mean, Vivo. It, Vivo with the next series. Yep. These moments where they're just like, we'll try it. We'll check it out. This uh, front camera is supposedly 32 megapixels, the sensor, and the rear camera is going to be a 64 megapixel sensor. But otherwise, we don't have a lot of information yet, and we won't have a lot of information until September 1st. But this particular render coming via the president of mobile devices for ZTE, Ni Fei. So it's, that's some official stuff. And, uh, and we're going to get one in studio. Willie Do is committed to the idea. And I have to say, I'm sick of all these punches. Huh? Yeah, every punch. Hole punch, yeah. fruit punch. Sick of it. Mm. I'm ready for the future. I hear you. Bring it on. I'm honestly not that bothered, but it, this, is our, this will be better. Mm -hmm. Full screen. The whole thing is like the future. It's like every commercial and music video that has the futuristic phone. It never. It's always all screen. Yeah, and you add the uh, in-display fingerprint. Yes, too. it's all in there. Oh. It's just a slab. Yeah. The future is That's a slab. The, the future is marble slab. Marble. You remember, remember marble slab? The ice cream place? Oh, yeah. You put, it's the cold, the cold, cold stone. Cold stone. Mm. It's the cold stone. And they mix it and they chop it. I think they still exist, but the ones around here yeah. all shut down. iPhone 12 event date. Are you curious? Well, guess what? Apple posted, then deleted a live event test on YouTube. Hmm. That's where we are right now. We're on YouTube. Are we? Yeah, we're also in the uh, podcast apps. Oh. But we're, we're on YouTube. And Apple, I don't know if this was on purpose. I don't know if this was, this was an accident. Of course, the speculation, we're well aware, that Apple's going to have to push back deliveries of the iPhone 12 because of delays. That's been all the rumors. That's been all the talk. So people were kind of expecting if you're going to have to push everything back, maybe you just push the event back too because what's the point of telling people about something they can't get for a long time, for months and months? Mm. You might not want to do it. That said, Apple typically runs an event at the beginning of September and they may want to do it anyways. They may have enough to talk about and feel strongly enough to, to, to put it out in the world and then wait. It's quite possible. Now this little uh, snafu, which it must be because it was deleted, uh, seems to indicate that Apple had at least, well, they, they ran a test. As you would with a live event, you can have a test event sitting there, but it has a date and a time on it. And if you scroll down to the actual tweet where this came out, there's a screenshot of what it looked like inside of a person's YouTube notifications. You can see, I guess that's French that we're looking at, the language, but you can see 10, 9, 20, 20, 10, 15. And uh, this would be where you would click for the reminder inside of your subscription feed if you were subscribed to the Apple channel. Mm. You, would, you would click on there for your reminder. So September 10th is the date that was out there. Now they went and deleted that event, the test event or the placeholder event. So this is, I'm gonna go over some important notes about this story. Last year's iPhone 11 event date was September 10th. Mm. So is it possible the person in charge of this channel page just rolled with the exact same date for the purpose of testing for the purpose of a placeholder even though an event was actually going to happen a month later maybe right. in october let's say okay that's option that's number possible, one yeah option number two they just loved that date they just love that date from last year and they do want to run it again and this wasn't supposed to go out as a test to let everybody know that's when it was going to happen hmm. that's a possibility as well what Seems to be fairly certain, though, is that no matter what happens and when they choose to do this event, there's going to be a bit of a wait for the actual phones. Hmm. Strategically, uh, it's kind of interesting to consider the better or worse approach. Do you want to know about the thing as soon as possible and then wait to get it delivered? Hmm. Or do you want to know about it when it's closer to ready so you can actually enjoy the thing in a period of time that's reasonable? That's up to the to the users. It's, it's it's amazing with Apple. They just put out a little test clip and people, now you got a story on 9 to 5 Mac. Conspiracy. Now you got a story on Lou later. Maybe you test the waters. Maybe yeah. you're seeing what people think about that date. So this was on YouTube, right? That was on YouTube. Um, do, they don't do live streams on YouTube, do they? Uh, uh, no, it's usually their... I think they, in recent years, have embraced YouTube. Oh, yeah. A little more so, I think so. Google product, kind of uh, interesting point you make there, Will. Oh. But it's all, who knows, because it's all up in the air in uh, in pandemic times. Yeah. 
you 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 may change your approach. They got a new marketing guy. Uh, uh, Phil Schiller decided to go hit the beach with the margarita, and the new marketing guy, he's going to be in touch with us. So we'll get the details. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, we'll get the detail. Yeah. New guy, new era. We have a wonderful camera comparison, budget camera phone shootout on Android Authority that caught my attention. And it's by Ryan Thomas Shaw. Shout out. He took the Google Pixel 4a, the OnePlus Nord, and the iPhone SE, and he put them head to head in the camera department, which is a big differentiating characteristic at the budget level. Now, I've paid attention to a couple of shootouts, iPhone SE versus uh, Pixel 4a, but now you add the Nord to the mix, which is another option in a similar price bracket. Worthy competitor. It's it's amazing to see the quality and caliber of these cameras at the subsequent price points. Obviously, the Pixel 4a, the cheapest of the bunch, mm. the most recent of the bunch as well. Yes. But I look through here, and, and uh, you know, on paper, you're, you're seeing the specs. The OnePlus Nord, by far the biggest main sensor, 48 megapixels. Also, the only one of the bunch that can shoot 4K video on the front-facing camera, in case you want to get crazy with the your selfie video. It can also it also has a 32 megapixel front facing camera just for stills, which is far beyond the uh, megapixel count for the Pixel 4a or iPhone SE, where the megapixel count for those two units very similar. Eight megapixels, seven megapixel on the front. They're both 12 megapixel on the back. You see, and so obviously a a different approach. OnePlus Nord puts the bigger sensor, but we know the type of work that the Pixel team puts into the software, and we know the type of work that the Apple team puts into the software and the processing. So what better way than to just uh, peep a few samples as you would? Now, on the first sample here, what you'll see is something that we already knew, the fact that the Pixel 4a trends a little bit cooler from a color temperature perspective, which is the flavor that I choose uh, for my own personal preference more frequently but might not necessarily be more accurate to real life. This particular uh, uh, writer, the writer of this article, the guy who ran this test said that that was closer to real life, to him, the cooler color temperature. Mm -hmm. And then also, of course, you have the contrast and everything else, which you can head over here and evaluate for yourself. And I suggest that you should, but the to, to my eyeballs, I'm living in Pixel Town. And actually I'm living in Pixel Town even more when you go to the next, which is the leaf. And you don't even need to open them up. Or maybe you should, but you have the 4A, the Nord, and the iPhone SE. Hmm. And I just look at the exposure on the 4A photo, where the iPhone one looks a little washy, a little wishy-washy. And then the Nord is, looks like it's lacking a little in the highlight. It's always been a story of contrast for me with the way that the pixel processing works. Hmm. Now, there is a photo where... Arguably, the iPhone performs better, which is indoors and in a lower lighting environment. That's this one right here, where it's able to kind of boost the dark areas to, to pull out more detail. If you want strictly the most detailed photo possible, granted, once again, we have a pretty significant shift in color temperature. But if we're just going solely on uh, detail, pulling detail, perception of a, a, a range of dynamics, otherwise known as dynamic range, then you may prefer the SE photo in that circumstance. But anyway, you scroll through, there's different sections for sharpness, detail, there's different sections for saturation and so forth, and zoom is in there as well. And you get to the bottom, and it's actually, no, oh, there's night mode also. If you go to the night mode photos, I mean, it's pretty obvious what's going on there. Go check those night modes. You got a slow scroll going on there today, Will. Mm. Uh, next one down. Next one down. Well, that one's good, too. Look at the pixel plant and the other two plants, and then go to the next one down. Look at the Lego guy. You can't even see the Lego guy on the OnePlus. This one looks like it has a spotlight on him. Yeah. The beard is much darker there. I mean, it, this is pretty obvious. The pixel wins that round. But you go to the very bottom, and all things considered, if you after examining all the samples, basically this is an easy one where the Pixel 4a comes out on top. This is a subjective thing. It doesn't mean that it's better in all circumstances. It doesn't mean it's the better camera even. It just means that this particular test yielded these particular results. You can take it for what it's worth. It's posted on Android Authority as well. So take that into mm -hmm. consideration. Uh, one of the phones in this, in this test is not an Android phone. Mm -hmm. So let's just keep that in mind. But... I'm going to go with the findings here 
I'm going to say of this group, if I had to pick only one camera, I would, from my personal preference, pick the 4A. So that uh, increases your perception of value for that device even more so if you were going to put the Nord in the mix and the iPhone SE in the mix. It's the cheapest of the bunch. And even if your preference is more towards warmer tones or even if your preference is more towards detail in the shadows, it's still 50 bucks cheaper than the iPhone SE. Right. Keep that in mind. Nice little analysis. Android 11 is going to bring wireless Android Auto to all phones. This is, I love this. I really love this. I think the biggest drawback with uh, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto is having to plug in every single time. And I have experience with this on multiple multiple vehicles. And inevitably, I take... Now, I know people who take long commutes. It's not as big of a deal. Because you're going to be listening to content the whole time. And you're going to... It's an extra... The percentage of the trip is very low that you spend plugging it in. But I take a lot of short trips. Mm. And many times, I just won't plug it in at all. And I'll just use Bluetooth to send the audio through. And then it's like, man, Android Auto is better than my in-car system. Mm. And I want to be using it all the time, but it's just that extra step for a 10-minute drive. You don't always plug it in. Pop it out of your pocket and plug it in. So wireless Android Auto gives you the best of both. It's a similar connection to... It's over Wi-Fi, not Bluetooth, but it's going to be similar from a functional perspective. You step into the car and it connects automatically. And all of a sudden, Android Auto is up on your dash. Now, you're going to need a Wi-Fi 5, but... It's coming to the whole lineup. Previously, it was only a handful of phones that were supported and a handful of vehicles that were supported. Well, it still is right now. But the big news, and you, you, you can scroll down here, they found it inside of a, a support page for Android Auto. It described what countries Android Auto can be used in. And then somewhere in there, there's a line saying any smartphone with Android 11 can use Android Auto wirelessly. So this is this is about to be a very big list. Yeah, that's very, impressive. Very quickly. And it's going to... Okay, so the major restriction is that your phone must be able to connect to a 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi network. And that's that could be a problem for some EU residents and Japan and Russia. But there's a long list of where this could possibly work. Uh, automotive companies like BMW have put wireless Android Auto support into their cars. That's the future. In my opinion. Now, I know Tesla, they want to do their own OS, but there's something about just having your phone pop up on your big display in your vehicle just as you s sit into it, just as you sit down and it's all right there. Mm -hmm. And it's familiar and it's Google Maps. If it's snappy enough, I mean, I got to test it, obviously, but from a functionality perspective, I'm into it. You don't even have to take out your phone. No. And place it onto... A table or a little uh, no, right there. it's connecting. It's a direct it's type of. It's a direct Wi-Fi connection. Cool. Yes, this is. Uh, it's the next level. Phones from LG, Motorola, Samsung, Nokia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Pixels, the wide variety of Android devices. Very exciting. You know how we always talk about the iPhone in India and how there's been this uh, massive transition towards India becoming a manufacturer for iPhones. Well, typically up until now, it hasn't been the flagship model of smartphone. It hasn't been the latest smartphone. It hasn't been the, the assembly of a smartphone that has yet to been, be released. It hasn't been that yet. Hmm. What it has been, it has been the budget models for domestic consumption to be sold within India or flagship models after their uh, initial release, uh, initial release phase. And so today's news here is actually pretty significant because apparently Apple supplier Wistron, who we talked about on a previous episode, hired 10,000 new people in India for a facility they're working on. Apparently, they've already started producing the iPhone 12. Wow. If this report is to be believed. So that marks a major transition where it's not some... Uh, one of the sub uh, sub flagship models, and it's not later on. It's to meet the criteria of launch, and it, and presumably to be uh, capable of hitting uh, a substantial volume. Mm. That would be the guess, considering the fact that they're already experimenting or at least beginning to run their trial production at the moment. 
This would be the seventh iPhone model to be manufactured in India, but the very first of the high-end units. So you've got the iPhone SE, which has been popular around the world, relatively speaking, based on Apple's figures. That one is expected to begin production by the end of 2020, so that will be a big shift. There'll be a lot of people hired for that. And But once this thing kicks off, I guess the aim here is mid-2021, all of a sudden you're going to have the pieces in place to be at that initial run of smartphones. Mm. And when it comes to volume, you know that initial phase is where the volume is. Mm. And where the volume is, is where the jobs are. Mm -hmm. And then you start talking about export. Mm. And so, so this is, this is a, a fairly significant development. We like to keep tabs on it. We like to know what's happening with all the Trons and all the Ons, whether it's Wistron, Foxconn, Pegatron. We will keep you updated here about all their uh, inner workings and all their movements and what they're producing and where. We take it as a personal challenge to follow the Ons. And Wistron... You can't get away with this without us knowing. It's not that there's anything you're getting away with. You hired 10,000 people, 10,000 jobs. It's pretty impressive. It's a lot of phones. Speaking of India, specific, specifically India and China, look at this, Will. If this is to be believed, India and China agree to resolve their outstanding issues expeditiously, quickly. Let's get over it. Awesome. You, know, you know the border region there? It was heating up. There's... Yeah. there's swirling jets around and uh, very angry. It's like, hey, guys, we're wasting a lot of fuel here. And there's a lot of fuel because uh, they're, you know, chill out, ready to go. And and then you got you to gotta get the troops over there and they got to sort of live there and some expenditure yeah. involved and a lot of stress. It would be so stressful. I can imagine, yeah. And people didn't know how it was going to shake out. You had, and, and, and look, anyone closer to the actual situation can let me know if things have eased up because it was getting pretty hot there for a minute the burning of the flags and everything else and the boycotting going on on both sides uh but this appears to be a, a move in the direction of peace a move in the direction of collaboration the two sides had a candid and in-depth exchange of views on the existing situation on the line of actual control that's, there's like a line that's in dispute. Where is this line? Mm -hmm. Where is where does India end and China begin? These mm -hmm. lines. Who knows yeah. about these lines? And then they dispute it and they say, well, you actually, you took five feet over there. Mm -hmm. And then they say, no, I didn't. That's always been like that. And then they say. It's like, where's that chalk line? Where yeah. Yeah, they, no, we moved. Yeah, someone erased it. Exactly. We drew it. Exactly. It's like when you're, when you're a kid and you play with the chalk, like you said, and all of a sudden your territory starts getting larger. <laughs> and your friends say, no, that wasn't like that before. You say, that's, yeah. my, that's my spot right there. That's my base. You can't enter past that line. Oh. India and China on Thursday agreed to resolve outstanding issues in an expeditious manner and in accordance with the existing agreements and protocols. The Ministry of External Affairs said after the two sides held a fresh round of diplomatic talks on a border standoff in eastern Ladakh. I, I mean, maybe I said that right. I try. The two sides were in agreement that restoration of peace and tranquility in the border areas would be essential for the overall development of bilateral relations. We got to get this border thing sorted out and then we can start to talk about everything else. Mm -hmm. We can then, and the reason I bring this up and I'm interested in this subject, as you know, as you're well aware, Will, is because it has huge implications for the tech industry. If these two parties get along and, and product flows across that, border and and into in across those regions there's massive implications for companies like apple massive implications for companies like samsung mm -hmm. and and google and xiaomi and oppo and vivo and oneplus and everybody involved yeah because there's been delays currently restrictions obviously we've talked about tariffs it's a lot going on and it may seem on the surface like a very like an isolated dispute that only has to do with that one thing, but it it can grow and become much larger mm -hmm. in how policy is made and how communications operate going forward in all facets of how two countries interact. Mm -hmm. And those are two mega countries that have uh, an influence on the world. So uh, this would be uh, if you're into the idea of 
communication between these two nations, then it looks like we're moving in that direction. I'd like to ask anybody watching this who's in either of those nations to chime in in the comment section how they feel about it all. Mm -hmm. Trump it has uh, endorsed a particular company in the TikTok, I want to buy TikTok sweepstakes. Hmm. Supermarket sweep. Do you remember what that is? Yes. Good. I saw a tweet. Shout out to whoever sent me a tweet. I honestly, I just saw it super casual as I was scrolling, telling me that Supermarket Sweep was available on Netflix. Many seasons. Oh, was it? Yeah, he, he sent me a tweet. He showed me the screenshot. Uh -huh. So if I ever need to take a trip down memory lane, I can catch up. They got a lot of episodes, yeah. which is kind of wild. I don't, I don't think it's going to fly at my house. You but can take them back. No, because the thing was, we back. settled on it because we had no selection. And, and if my grandmother said it was on, I didn't have a say in that matter. Oh. So it would just be on. And nowadays... So you didn't enjoy it? No, I did. But what I'm trying to say nowadays, it's so much selection. Oh, yeah. They have the freedom. To oh, my whatever. God, man. My house, you kidding me? There's, a, there's too much uh, to choose from. Anyway, mm -hmm. Trump has uh, basically said, let's see the quote here. He, he likes Oracle. We talked about how Oracle all of a sudden got into the mix. Trump likes Oracle. Ellison and Trump have been pals. Mm -hmm. Ellison has run major fundraisers for Trump in the past. Mm -hmm. Pals. So he's sitting there saying, oh, yeah, I can endorse this guy. This guy's at least one of my supporters. Now, who knows the relationship with Microsoft? between Microsoft and Trump. I think Gates says some nasty things, even though he's in, involved with Microsoft in a limited way. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's a huge Trump guy at all, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not following this back and forth, but I don't think he is. Whereas this, whereas Ellison, on the other hand, the Oracle guy and Trump go way back and they're pals. And what's weird about this is that, well, it's not weird at all. It's by design. Trump has such a huge say in this negotiation that his... Him having a favorable impression of the company with who, who might actually execute this deal is a key to getting the deal done. Mm -hmm. It's not an option. Mm -hmm. And then there's one other piece that shows up in this particular article about Microsoft not necessarily being being uh, completely separate from from China or any operations in China. I didn't I didn't know this. So, you know, I try to follow what's happening in China as far as American brands are concerned. And, you know, Google has a limited footprint. Apple has a bit of a footprint. Facebook, limited footprint. Microsoft does have a footprint in China. Windows! Yeah, a big part of operating systems. Windows is still a thing. We don't think about it, but Windows is huge. It's mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah. And on top of Windows, they actually run LinkedIn there. And I'm going to go one step further. They run Bing, the search engine in China. Yeah. Not that I ever use this search engine, but that is one of the few in the absence of having Google there. I presume a couple of people use Bing in China. There's a local version over there. And they've had to meet China's uh, uh, rules in order to operate there, whatever those user data demands happen to be. Mm. So this might be causing some sort of a delay in the negotiations saying, wait a sec, you have you agree with this data that this data can stay there and then why is this data not gonna, why is that not gonna happen? Meanwhile, if Trump makes a deal with uh, Ellison from Oracle, he says, here's the rules. Mm. Oracle has very limited operations in China. They have some sort of a footprint, but almost none. And they're pals, so you can just call them up and say, I need that data in my backyard. Yeah. And Ellison would say, yeah, of course, no problem. Yeah. We're pals, remember? You can come ride on, I think he's into sailboats. Some kind of boat racing yeah. Ellison happens to be into, I believe. So maybe Trump can meet him on the boat, or Ellison can meet Trump on a golf course, whatever yeah. it is that they, that they do, and they can sort it out. But again, remember some of my speculation last time around when we talked about Oracle coming into the mix was that it would be a partnership that's not speculation. That was part of the original report. It will be a partnership with current ByteDance investors on American soil, Sequoia and General Atlantic, who do, they don't want to give up all this growth. Mm -hmm. They don't want to give up all this TikTok opportunity. So they're just searching around for Trump's pals who have a few bucks. It's like, wait, that guy, the Oracle guy, 
Trump loves him. Yeah, they're buddy buddies. Trump loves him. Let's put the Oracle brand on it. They got cloud stuff and their pals, and they have a limited footprint in China, and he hosted a fundraiser in the past. We're all good. Perfect. You see how it works, Will? No. It all, it all comes together. The puzzle, all the pieces fit. Mm. We have our very first PS5 ad, a television ad, and it highlights some of the capabilities of the new controller, including the far more advanced haptic stuff that's going on and the, the surround sound aspect. Now, it's not a game per se. It's kind of a... Well, it's like a dem demonstration, a graphical demonstration. It's very moody. It's very dramatic. I can't tell. Is that a... That's not a person. That's a... Is that CG? CG? That's uh, CG. But it's some nice CG. And this is apparently uh, the, the title of this ad. Play has no limits. PlayStation 5. She lights the match. She pulls a bow and arrow at one point which that's going to be a big part of the haptics that you can actually feel tension mm -hmm. because that's so much more refined on the upcoming PS5. So the aim of this commercial is to showcase or to try to give you a taste of what that hap what those haptics might be like using only visuals and sound. But the mm -hmm. visuals, I don't know. What do you say, Will? Yeah, I think they're, they look great. Yeah? There seems to be like a lot of... Uh texture going on you like texture I, I, yeah I love big texture, texture guy is there any of the tracing going on that you like <laughs> some light bouncing <laughs> yeah, yeah what's going what's going on with the light it's it's going it's going there's lighting involved uh this game death loop are you interested in that death loop yeah have you heard no, of I that heard of it death loop uh it's delayed but the director of the game development for it has mentioned that the adaptive triggers and haptics will bring physicality to game experiences and give important feedback for the game. Hmm. So, obviously, developers... You know what it kind of reminds me of? The uh, the art style is similar to Death Proof, the oh, yeah. Tarantino, Tarantino movie. Yeah. Kind of like that same era. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I don't know if it, if it will be or won't be. I actually don't know much about this game, but... Yeah, any developer developing for PS5 can take advantage of these extra features and find ways to create more immersive experiences. That's the aim of this commercial. It's trying to portray to you uh, what it's going to be like to pull a bow and arrow mm. or whatever else you're doing. Mm. Are you excited? Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't believe you. You're more excited about this next story because it talks about Microsoft Flight Simulator. Finally, we get to talk about it. <laughs> no, we talked about it yesterday, Well, Yeah, I know. Finally again. Yeah. Finally is the simulator update section of the show. Now, this is funny because people, they fly around and they look for glitches. It's like, why? Are you mad about this? Of course. Like, I mean, you're mapping the whole world. Well, man. <laughs> well, you're getting too fired up here. Like, obviously, there's going to be some... Uh, some hitch are you telling these people to have some respect here for all the hard work going into oh, it oh yeah oh yeah bud <laughs> you're like a grumpy old man right now you know that yeah. well this one a lot of people found so the first image here is a giant towering looking thing that people found in melbourne australia and it's probably not going to be there forever but people are trying to catch their photos right now before it goes away mm. these are enthusiasts they're not trying to make fun of the game well they just or maybe they are but oh. You get where I'm coming from. That you would, if you were playing this game a number of hours and you're on quarantine or whatever, sitting at home, this might be a fun trip for you to go check out the giant. You're not happy. You're still very <laughs> upset about it. All right. So you have that one. If we scroll down to the next, and it's kind of interesting how this works. Scroll, uh, scroll down a little bit further right there. That's Buckingham Palace. Yes. <laughs> I saw this article. Okay. It's uh, you it's saw just an office building, right? It's replaced by an office building. Yeah, so it's supposed to be an elaborate palace, yeah. but instead you have a generic-looking office building. Now, this is a landmark. This is very important to people, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, last time I'm in, I'm in London, I believe, was around the time some uh, royals were getting married. Oh. And it was in it was every broadcast. I couldn't every screen, all the fronts of the newspapers, oh. the cab driver asking my opinion 
I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's huge. It's huge. The royal thing is huge yeah. over there. So uh, they got you got to nail the Buckingham Palace. Uh, apparently, the game because the game uses Azure powered procedural generation technology to fill in gaps in the Bing Maps data. Landmarks and bridges will be generated in some cases by AI. Mm -hmm. It will just take a guess. Yep. And it's not a terrible guess, to be honest. The shape of it is pretty much there. Yep. But you do wonder why the map doesn't have a better impression of the actual palace to begin with. Now, I'm going to say something here, Will, to potentially save the situation and make you feel better. Mm. It's possible that in certain circumstances where a per person doesn't have great bandwidth, they will get a, a scaled down version because they can't, they're not pulling the information fast enough mm. because it's, a, it's an enormous uh, database. And if you scroll down, <laughs> that one's kind of funny. You know that monument in Washington? Yeah. Yeah, it turned into a skyscraper. <laughs> it turned into a skyscraper. And palm trees, those are palm trees there in California that look like. Uh, like. The monolith. The monolith from Space Odyssey 2001. And this one, next one I really like. It's a football field that looks like a, 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 <laughs> the middle is carved out yeah. and it's like the inside of an apartment building. Anyway, yeah, no, I, I read here. So the, the writer of this article visited that actual field themselves and it was perfectly fine, huh. that stadium. So because they're speculating that you couldn't fix something like that in development as rapidly as the original report came in, they're assuming that some of these visual glitches could be related to internet connectivity as uh, the the streaming the data is streaming from the developer to Power Flight Simulator. Oh right, so I guess these are maybe placeholders until the data sh the real data shows up. Yeah, it guesses until the real data shows up. It's a really amazing thing to think about. Mm -hmm. And it could also be because those players don't enable the full data download when they configure their game. Mm. And then there's going to be more guessing as well for them if they're trying to limit bandwidth. It's almost like 100 gigs. It's, it would be it's yeah. enormous. Well, 100 gigs for the game to install. Game. Yeah, yeah, but but the, if you enable full bandwidth, then you're pulling... Yeah, I heard it's like Lord two no. petabytes. Two petabytes of world. information. It's, yeah. it's absolutely insane. Anyway, for me, it was a bit of fun. I didn't expect you to get so offended. Well, well I am. I mean, I never saw you that angry. <laughs> Speaking of being offended, Razer, the gaming company that everybody knows and loves, uh, they're uh, making products that are not gamer-oriented or gamer-centric. They're branching out, and they have a new work-from-home setup, which is more minimal. And, and you can see it here. It's a real departure for them. I don't blame them. A lot of people in the work-from-home kind of scenario right now looking for uh, maybe a clean or minimal type of keyboard and mouse and if you're already making them you just change the styling a little bit yeah in the case of the keyboard maybe more so the mouse sort of looks like something completely unique in fact the mouse they worked with an ergonomics company called human scale they do a lot of office furniture am i right about that is it human scale yes they did they worked with human scale to come up with an ergonomic shape or design it actually looks kind of reminiscent of the mouse that you and i use and everybody in this studio uses which is the variety of master mice uh, dating this is the third one over here but mm -hmm. i've had every single version one here. even back to the performance the shape of it for ergonomics very nice they're calling theirs the pro click and it's designed to keep the wrist at a neutral 30 degree angle to minimize the risk of developing conditions such as tendonitis and carpal tunnel it has palm thumb and pinky supports to reduce the strain because you're working from home you're on this thing all day long mm. the keyboard is going to be uh, backlit with white LEDs that are durable, 80 million keystrokes. It's not going to be uh, cheap. It will have Pro Razer Pro key switches, Razer's orange mechanical key switches. The keyboard's 140 bucks, and the mouse is 100 bucks. So it better be pretty good because, in the sort of uh, what would you call it, the productivity space, mm -hmm. that's quite quite expensive mm -hmm. maybe less so in the gamer space but in the productivity space that's quite expensive for those accessories so we'll see how it shakes out for them but you know you got to branch out times yeah. change you got to branch out it's a smart move 
I mean, that's a good look. That desk right there. Look at that thing. Uh -huh. You could maybe get some work done. I don't know. No. Probably play flight simulator. Of course. Uber and Lyft are having some big uh, trouble, big problems over there in California. Did you yeah. read about this? I uh, I read a title that Lyft got shut down. Yeah, so, so there's this new law saying that companies like Uber and Lyft are no longer going to be able to allow their drivers to be independent contractors mm. and that they would have to be employees, have to be treated as employees. And they obviously have so many drivers already and their entire business is set up and business model, profitability, everything is set up around this idea that those are independent contractors. There's, it be, comes along with all kinds of different accounting stuff, obviously. Mm -hmm. And insurance and benefits. Be oh my God, it's a it's a, a difficult. They're not necessarily. I, w I mean, I, I guess they are against the idea, but they're they're willing to work together. They want they want the thing to be put on pause. But California said no pause. Here's the mandate. Here's the date. And so then Uber and Lyft came out and said, well, if there's not going to be a pause, there's absolutely no way we can rework these businesses in the amount of time necessary. So we're going to have to shut down. And a lot of people rely on these services, mm. Uber and Lyft, uh, especially in, in cities like Los Angeles and they don't, there's not the best public transit there. And you got to get around by car a lot, but it can be an absolute nightmare. Not everybody has a car. So Uber and Lyft is an affordable way to, to move about cities. Those people are going to be kind of messed up. Those that have built a habit around using those services. Yeah. Now, it's not impossible to do this. In fact, the early days of Uber operated sort of more like a traditional limo company that would own the 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 its own fleet and then have employees, hmm. right? And there would be a dispatch and it would kind of work like that. And in the early days of Uber, they were going back and forth, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, kind of operating that way. But the issue with that is keeping enough drivers on the road because once you have employees, they have to be working. Mm -hmm. And so you'll never have the same inventory of drivers. Whereas if you have in, these guys working as contractors, if they're just not busy that night, they could be like, you know what? I'm going to flip on my Uber app and I'll just chill because I was going to head to the McDonald's anyways. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, I caught, I caught a, a passenger. Okay, cool. I'll give, give him a ride, earn a few bucks. Mm -hmm. As a contractor, you could do that. But as an employee, what, what tools exist? It's much harder because then you have time structures and... Yeah. It's just a diff, more difficult thing to map. So they may be able to make the changes, but it, it totally looks like at this point, they will have to shut down at least temporarily and people will be without rides. Though I should mention, this doesn't affect Uber Eats and the food delivery stuff. Yeah, I was going to ask you, yeah. is this going to be a thing for food delivery? No. So for whatever reason, I don't know why. You would assume it would be the same thing. Yeah. But but it isn't currently touching the food delivery delivery portion of Uber, and I don't. I guess Lyft doesn't. I don't think they do a food delivery portion. Um, the lawsuit and injunction order only applies to ride hail, the ride hailing portion of Uber and Lyft's businesses. Meaning Uber can continue to operate its eats food delivery business regularly in the state, and Lyft can continue operating uh, offering its scooters and bikes, for example. So. <clears throat> it's anybody who's uh, the new taxis of the world, that yeah. that that group. And so anyway, and, and if you're in California, let me know how you feel about that. If you need these uh, services and what you're going to do in the absence of Uber and Lyft operating, I'm curious. Speaking of cars, we have our electric vehicle update of the day. We have this uh, strange little clip posted to social media of a Lucid Air drag racing a Tesla Model S. Lucid Air is that upcoming EV. I believe some of the people working on it used to be at Tesla. It's supposed to crush everything. Drag coefficient, range, Lucid Air. And we've seen some pretty cool images of it. Look at that. There you go. There's the image I was talking about. Well, everybody wants to know, okay, what about the performance? Talk a big game. Now, this particular video, which showed up on social media, quarter mile race, Tesla versus Lucid Motors, stay tuned. And it was posted on the E4 Electric Twitter account. You can hit the play button there. And you can probably tell that the Lucid Air vehicle crushed the Tesla. Now, 
the Tesla Model S has really gone unchallenged. It, it crushes almost everything off the line, especially. Never mind further down the track. Now, we don't know if they're running similar tires. We don't. There's a lot of unknowns. We don't know exactly which Tesla it is. In fact, many people immediately began to criticize it, saying this is a joke. It's against a 2012 Model S, right? But then the response from E4Electric said, yes, it's actually the fastest Tesla to date, hmm. which would imply it's a more recent one. And so a lot of people are curious exactly which Model S that was. There's rumors already that the Lucid Air can blow away a Model S Raven in, court, in a quarter mile. So there could be a lot of competition in the space real quick. You have the Taycan competing for the performance champ. You have the Lucid Air around the corner. And you know Tesla, they're not sleeping. They're working on a plaid mode because they don't want clips like this out here either. Yeah. But it's interesting nonetheless. Uh, the only word we have to go on is whatever this E for Electric posts on Twitter saying it's the latest Tesla. And if it is, that's big news because that thing's been tough to beat. For a long time. Oh, yeah.